Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is your host, Jim Masters, and welcome to the Jim Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. We're bringing back the Lost Art of Conversation and Style with guests coming in from all around the world, from all different backgrounds and disciplines, and celebrity friends from Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, and all the rest. How is everybody doing today? It's so good to see all your smiley faces. We're sending you some of our famous JMS Lovity all across the globe. Thanks for being with us, and thanks for all of your enthusiasm for our series, hundreds and hundreds of episodes we've done so far, and it's really amazing, and all the guests coming in from around the world, and all our viewers, our lovely viewers watching from around the world as well. If you'd like to interact with one another and with us right now during the show, you can, because in our JMS Live Lovely chat room, which is open right now when the shows are on, you could actually comment during the course of the show. Say hello to one another, which a lot of you love to do. Something interactive and exclusive we do here on the show, because as you guys know, I'm an interactive on-air personality and host, and I like to interact. So you guys are kind of like our virtual studio audience. You're there. We see comments from you. Sometimes we might even sprinkle a couple of them here uh, on the bottom of the screen during the show. How exciting that would be, right? It kind of reminds you of when you would call into a telethon and you would call in your $10 supporting the telethon. And then all of a sudden you'd wait and wait and wait to see if your name would scroll on the bottom. You know, Bobby Smith, $10 from Bohemia, New York or whatever. <laughs> I used to do that when I was a kid and I would believed in a particular, uh, you know, telethon or what the uh, charity was about. I would phone in some $5, $10, whatever you had. And then you'd get excited to see the name scrolling on the bottom. Like there it is. And <laughs> so uh, you might even see a comment or two uh, sprinkled here. Of course you can do super chat, super emoji, super stickers during the show that helps support the show and all the rest. Super thanks. So welcome everybody from wherever you're watching across the United States, Canada, Mexico, North America, our viewers who watch us in South America, Australia, New Zealand, those who watch throughout Europe and Asia and Africa. We really appreciate all of you here. And thanks for sharing the links. Thanks for all the comments, the emails, the uh, tweets, the Instagram messages and posts, sharing the social media links on all of your social media, like Facebook and elsewhere. We appreciate it. We also want to say a quick happy birthday to iconic actress, singer, and dancer, Cheetah Rivera. Yes, this is her 90th birthday. I had an opportunity to meet her and have a great conversation with her when she was performing on Broadway in The Visit in New York City. And she's just a gem, an American treasure. So we say happy birthday. I posted on social media a photo of me and Cheetah, a really beautiful time at a gala party that we were at. And it was really nice. She really is amazing. So happy birthday to Cheetah Rivera. Speaking of the entertainment industry and somebody who knows just about everybody, somebody who's been in it for a long time and gives back by mentoring students, he happened to be uh, child star Gary Coleman's agent at one time, talent agent for a number of years too. And many soap stars, Kim Zimmer, you know, and many others, and he, of course, is an extraordinary writer, producer, and lecturer into his own right. Victor Perillo is here, coming to us from Burbank, California. He was just here on the East Coast in the United States uh, just days ago, doing some lectures and presentations in the city to students, which I think is fantastic. He's originally from New York. Uh, he's got a lot to share with us. He's a veteran of the entertainment industry. Again, he attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York, the HB Studio Director's Program. At the Actors Studio, he worked with Gordon Phillips on studio projects, Marathon 33 and The Baby Elephant, and lots more. He was also an AFTRA union representative for 10 years. AFTRA is, of course, the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. The two have merged, that being the Screen Actors Guild, SAG and AFTRA are now merged. He established the first AFTRA showcase, which led to the establishment of the current AFTRA SAG showcases. He was assigned to NBC, thoroughly familiar with actors' rights and working condition roles, as well as a talent agent, he was a theatrical talent agent in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, where he owned the Victor Perillo Talent Agency. He represented, of course, 
child actor Gary Coleman. You know him, of course. He had that stint on Good Times, but of course, different strokes. He even produced seven movies of the week for NBC with Gary Coleman. In addition to Gary, he placed and represented more than 12 actors for daytime television, including Kim Zimmer, three-time daytime Emmy winner Kim Zimmer, and many, many, many others. In addition to that, there's the Center for the Trained Professional Performer. Mr. Perillo established this nonprofit organization to provide a place where trained and gifted actor graduates from university, college, and conservatory training can be showcased to major television networks, film companies, and theater casting directors and producers. This would be centered in a national actors convention composed of only actors who have trained at theater programs in the United States. Producer, yes, as well, produced TV movies and feature films starring Gary Coleman and many others, pilots for television and uh, discreet services, the Rev produced in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's written articles for The Soul of the American Actor, a New York published newspaper for actors. Just completed his book, The Actor and the Craft of Acting Held Hostage. And he's uh, in pre-production for The Lambert Chronicles, a World War II feature film written by him. He gives all kinds of lectures, conducted more than 400 lectures and workshops free of charge at universities, colleges, and conservatories in the past 40 years. He's a regular speaker at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, the new school for drama for their graduate students. It's a representative short list of theater schools where he has conducted lectures, the new school for drama in New York, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, New York, Southern Methodist University, Dallas, Northwestern Theater School, Chicago, National Theater Conservatory, Denver, Emerson College, Boston, Massachusetts, Boston Conservatory of Music in Boston, and the National Theater Conservatory, uh, Conservatory in Montreal, Canada. That gang, <laughs> that's just the short list. Yes. We're going to talk about everything, all these different things and some really exciting projects that he's working on and lots more. So I invite you to uh, put your hands together and join me in welcoming an entertainment industry veteran and uh, a renowned person. He first started pursuing acting Yes, in the very beginning, we're going to talk about all of that, all of his pursuits, everything that he's done. He's made his mark and continues to make his mark in this extraordinary industry. And coming to us from his home in Burbank, California, exclusively, we welcome Victor Perillo. Victor, welcome to the Jim Masters Show. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Jim. I'm exhausted just listening. To it. <laughs> Did I go all that? <laughs> That's I'm just, tired. I'm just tired listening to it. <laughs> Your mother faxed it to us and said, "Read it verbatim, Jim, or else." <laughs> oh, really? really? I understand. <laughs> wait, wait. So, uh, New York boy originally, right? That's Tell right. us about uh, the upbringing in New York and how that influenced things for you. Well, I, I went to school in Connecticut, uh, you yes. know, in Waterbury, and I uh, decided the day the day after I graduated from high school that I'm leaving. And uh, to start this uh, training at the American Academy and um, the HB Studios, and uh, I've done um, nothing else. You know, I was fortunate enough to study with people that were um, connected with the actor studio. I was not a member of the studio, but I did many projects there, and um, I was fortunate enough to work with people that were tremendously uh, serious about the work. And that uh, stayed with me through my life, and I try to give that back uh, when I talk to people. So I'm a. Uh, people call you. Well, you know, you're just an old timer, and uh, you know, you, you you're old school. And I I never knew what that meant because you know, the truth is the truth. It never ages. <laughs> right. <laughs> it just doesn't age. So uh, if if that's the case, you know what? But the the greatest joy I think, um, and I've had a lot of. The successes and I've had a lot of good, good, good failures as lo like everybody else does but uh, I feel the the most satisfying part of this career is to talk to um, the theater students and the serious kids because I was one of them mm. and uh, if I could share with them uh, you know the downfalls of this craft and prepare them and make certain that everything they're learning at the academy and uh, neighborhood playhouse and Juilliard, 
that they actually use it, you know, right. uh, and, and to separate this fact that unfortunately, years ago in the 60s, uh, I lived through this in the 70s, a new breed of producer came along and they were advertising uh, people, they were marketing people and they had no very little background in, in theater or show business. And unfortunately, I saw them come in and make a business out of the craft. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, they they had an agenda, and their agenda was was to make this a business and not an art anymore. Right. And uh, so, these these kids that are graduating from these schools are confronted with that uh, on a daily basis. And I'm there to fight it back and tell them to. They think it's when they don't get a job, they think it's them. <laughs> it has nothing to do with them. You know, and, and I, I encourage them, look, use everything you you learned. That's that's what's going to keep this art fresh, you know, and keep it an art. Um, so that's that's one of the missions I've been on. And that's why I speak to the to them, you know. And uh, so so far after I, well over hundreds of schools through the 40 years, um, it never gets old, you know. Yeah, and I can get on the plane when I go back home and have a you know, feeling in my soul that I think I helped at least 10 people, you know, with encourage them and inspire them to, to, to stay in this craft, you know, uh, and, um, and that's it. You know, we, we have a, we have an industry that, um, unfortunately 90% of the people believe this is a business and it's gimmickry. And, and, uh, I, I just don't, I, I've seen it happen. I've seen people work. All the people you mentioned that I got on daytime soaps, they were all, trained theatrically, you know, they had absolutely nothing on their resume. <laughs> and I made the producers see them. I said, just watch them work. Just watch yeah. them work. That's, that's their, you know, the pictures and resumes don't act, you know, you can look <laughs> at them all day, you know, and um, just watch the people work. And that's how I sold my actors. I went through a showcase. You just watch them work. It's all about the work, you know, and, um, and that's it. So I think, I think we're, making a dent uh, the center that you talked about was a um, an idea that i had to uh and i think i'm going to get it financed um mm -hmm. and it's got to be with people of a like mind you don't see dollar signs after things you know it's free you know the showcases would be free nobody has to pay um you know i'm, I'm a big you know i've had a lot of problems with this years ago when the casting directors were out there charging actors uh, for advice and counsel, <laughs> which they never use any of it that they get. Yes. And, and I think that they're getting paid by their networks and by their production companies. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of what they talk about is common sense, but at the same time, um, I, I just think it's a conflict of interest and, in and, in, um, and, and I think that if they were the actor who took the, one of their workshops were to go in front of them the next day, none of that stuff did they use because then it was always, you know, what do they look like and what have you done lately? <laughs> exactly right. You know, and, yeah. and instead of what have you done presently? And, you mm -hmm. know, I have um, lectured mm -hmm. in Canada. I lived up in Vancouver. I work with actors in Canada and Montreal. And um, they have a different approach to this in in Europe I'm working on a project in Germany now as you know what would you say is the different approach and Vancouver has become well, such a hub for uh, shoots and for filming right well the, the Vancouver is this the, you know the northern Hollywood but yeah. we go up there to shoot you see we go up there to shoot but I found in in Canada and in Europe that people are involved with the story and with the author's intent yeah. and they pay homage to the um to the author and and that's what this is about and it's not all about and the, the actor up there knows he's playing a part of a, of a story and he's honored to be part of that story um and it's not a star system they don't they don't understand the star system they all get involved i, I had meetings with people in germany who were set designers and um costume people uh, on my uh, holocaust script that i'm working on and they read the script and they would talk to me about uh, about what the story is about, you know, not mm. not, you know, this is my deal. This is what I get. This is how much I get. I only work these days. And uh, everybody seems to be involved with telling the story. And I think we have to get back to that instead of 
telling the story of my career and I did two films and and on I should be a star in this one or a co-star it's you know the 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 author the playwright the, the script writer didn't write the script about you <laughs> <laughs> right. he wrote it about a character now he goes to you because you have the ability to make a transition into uh, another person and and um I think we forgot that I think we're um you know, right now we're we're insisting that actors do their home videos. We're making yes. producers out of them for auditions, self, self tapes, and all. Self tapes, yeah. and that they have to become their own. They have to pay thousands of dollars with the right camera equipment and all. All the lighting and has to be right. Light. Yeah. And I I think uh, uh, the the problem with that is they're forgetting the ma the magic of watching an actor come into audition, where you feel his spirit in front of you you know in in the audition room where, where it's supposed to be you know and uh and this thing of looking at a person's resume until the cows come home you know about trying to figure out whether they could look at a picture and that picture is one eight millionth of their life <laughs> photograph <laughs> and how that picture could represent that they can reach 27 different emotions we tell the actresses what to you know to get their face lifted and do this and get the nose fixed and this and this and we do all that about a look and then when they're playing they get the job they're playing somebody else right right <laughs> it has nothing to do with them and the the more beige you are as a person just beige you know right it's right the difference what you look like in life it's just, it's how you make the transition and we we prove that you know uh you know we prove that we take a look at people that we study actors from the 1800s to 1900s and when they get on their feet and they work the magic happens you know no one knew how gary coleman worked you know i asked him once i asked him I, after he did an episode of different strokes i said how do you do this thing called acting and he says you know when the director asked me to laugh i laughed and when i asked when the director asked me to cry i cry and, and now i don't want to talk about it he never wanted to talk about it no but his instincts were uh, appreciated by the greats you know and um so there's a, there's a whole story behind him and and um i think that hope hopefully the documentary will, will get that out um there's a misunderstanding about what happened when he quit there's certainly uh the attacks on his parents that are not they're they're not warranted by any means um you know and um but you know i'm still in touch with them and uh, i hope this documentary can can help a lot of people you know you had so a wonderful relationship I mean. representing child actor gary coleman uh through the different strokes years and, and beyond tell us about how that all came together and you and i were chatting before we went live on the mm -hmm. air gary was you know they would say cute as a button and these right. one liners, you know, right. and all these, these quick, quick quips, mm -hmm. he was able to grasp and master and deliver. And he was a terrific actor, but mm -hmm. even more than being what we saw on screen on good times, on different strokes and movies, he was quite um, a person of not only great intelligence, but also mm -hmm. had this old school, Right. Quality about him. Right. Tell right. us about, from your perspective, the real Gary Coleman, aside from the persona that we saw on these iconic series and shows. Right. Well, the first thing to understand is that he was a kid, you know, and, and I met him when he was six years old. I, I was an agent in Chicago, and he came walking into my office, and he had uh, two teeth missing, and he right. was in a three piece suit, and he would laugh and carry on and he was a child he was always a child his passion was um watching television he studied television he knew every show on television he um you know loved trains he collected trains and he that was his that, that was his hobby but uh what what was uh, fascinating about him is he took interest in everybody that approached him uh he talked to people he didn't know uh, if you were out in a restaurant and, uh, you know, someone asked him for his autograph while he was eating, didn't bother him at all. And then he started talking to the people as if they, they knew him. They would blow their minds. You know, he would just he would just carry on a conversation. Um, and one time 
during the years of NBC contract, he every year we would have to negotiate new things that he wanted and all, which was never my he 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 never considered himself a star. Uh, he loved to, he loved to act. He loved to love, make people laugh. But he asked me, he says, the only thing I want is for them to reduce the number of times uh, um, I say what you're talking about. <laughs> so, talking about Willis. Yeah. Talking about Willis. <laughs> and, and and when I went to NBC, they said, is that all he wants? I said, yeah, that's all. That's, that's as far that's as it goes. Sense. And um, he asked me how I was coming along with that. I said, well, it's taking time. And the, a beat would go by. And he said, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to to copy it, to say the things that he said, because when they come out of his look and his yeah. mouth. Yeah, it was you know, and, plastic. And, and plastic. And, and the other thing about it, it was so mysterious how he was able to pick up a script and within 10 minutes, he, he knew the lines, but he also knew everybody else's, he knew the story, you know? Yeah. And when you talk to the directors that, um, that work with him on the movies of the week, they would come over to me and they said, you know, this is, um, this is uncanny the way he he works. He his first movie of the week was the kid from Left Field, and uh, That's right. and and he uh, and he had a scene there where he cried. You know, he had a cry, and we couldn't stop him from crying. He went on, you know, for hours. We had to take a break, <laughs> but he he was wonderful with the yeah. directors. He was wonderful with people. He he gave back, and you know, and all of this nobody understood this, but we didn't bring it forward. He was doing a portable kidney trans uh, transfer three times a day. He had he had kidney problems, and yes. and since since birth, his his parents adopted him with the knowledge of that when he was two or three days old, you know, yeah. and uh, and he went through this like a like a, a soldier, like a champ, and uh, and he did this when he was doing his movies. He did it when he was diff on different strokes, and. Um, he had, um, it, it was something to, to be said that when you were around him, you thought you were around um, uh, a soul, a very, a spirit. And he, he, uh, he had this way of um, every, every adult, every child that watched the show, he appealed to everybody, you know. Yeah. And, and after yeah. you saw him, you, to this day, if you watch the reruns of Different Strokes, all of that talent is still there. You know, yeah. that show was, uh, you know, was, was magnificent. So that's, you know, I can go on for, for hours about different stories and all, but I think it's important to know that uh, the later years, when he was 16 and 17, uh, he had some bad advice and, and, um, and people in his ear uh, that, that made him a little bitter. Uh, there's also from his doctors tell me that a lot of kids that have kidney disease have a bitterness about, um, you know, the, with the medicines they take and so forth. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of that happened. And, you know, a young man at 16 and 17, we all get a little bitter, you know, <laughs> it happened. Absolutely. Happens. Yeah. And, and, and we're going into transition. You know, thank God I had the army to take care of me. But <laughs> right. And, you know, and that that straightened a lot of young men up. And uh, but the point is that I think that, uh, that, that there's something about not only Gary, but I truly believe that some incredible performers have been sent to us from whatever source you want to say to entertain us, to keep us, um, keep us entertained and just happy we're alive. And I think that um, I believe Gary was one of them. I truly believe it. You know. And you mentioned that they're actually working on a, you're involved in a documentary on Gary's right. life, right? right? That's right. exciting. Yeah. It's with the uh, finally, you know, and uh, NBC, the good people at NBC decided to, you know, to take on this project. And uh, we, we've interviewed some people and I think it's going to be very informative. Uh, certainly we'll cover his early life and all his accomplishments. But, you know, later on when, when um, things got a little dark for him, you know, I think we should bring that out to the open. And we've already did about 10, 10 or 15 interviews so far on the subject. And um, and and, I'm, and the NBC is looking forward to it, and so are we. So you you feel this sort of not a burden, but a responsibility, even with Gary gone a number of years now, mm -hmm. to still tell his story, to yeah. still share in his life, and celebrate yes. the person and 
and all that he has brought to us and his mm -hmm. legacy and who he really was right. in a truthful, honest, real, and warm feeling right. way, right? Right. I think we have to do that because when- It's beautiful to do that. Well, well I, th I think we all should do it. I think if we you know, are in an industry for many years and we see things that are right or wrong, and I think we should share that. You know, I think we have a moral and ethical obligation to share things. And certainly, you know, the way the press handles stars and what he went through and his parents went through, um, they, they didn't they didn't capture him or who he was. Uh, I believe that a lot of his the negativity in, in the later years that came out of his, his mouth, uh, he was uh, inspired to do that and instigated to do it by certain people that wanted to take over his life and um, and his career. Uh, you know, I mean, I met him when he was six, you know, so I mean, I was with him until he was 19 and we became, we stayed as friends after he left. Um, Almost probably like years. a father figure in a way, or well, you're I, just I, with your advice or guidance. I, I try to be, you know, when you represent a six-year-old kid, you can't take him to lunch for a business meeting or <laughs> take him to go, right. uh, you, know, you know, have a business meeting with him, I buy him a drink. You know, it's not kind of, you, you have to deal with his parents and you have to have that communication. And he and I would never talk business except we had timeouts where I would take him. This is what's being offered to you. What do you think? And we would have that. And then the rest of the time it was out buying trains for him. And I tried to, we, we all, his parents and I, we all try to keep him as a kid, you know, and uh, he had no ego, absolutely none, none at all. He had no, he had no demands of this and this and this. He respected the director. He respected the actors he worked with. Uh, he had no demands. and. The, the, the sad story about this is he wrote a cartoon and he wrote it, he put it into a script. It was about space, you know, and he always loved the space. And, um, and years after different, when different strokes ended, we took him around to try to sell his project, you know, and, and what's so sad about it, nobody would buy it. And he just, he looked at me, he says, I, I don't know. He says, I, I did all this work and nobody wants to even look at what I've done. Um, it, it, it broke my heart because it's, it's true. You know, an actor puts seven to 10 years on a, on a, uh, episodic show. People only know him. And then when the show goes off, Type, you're no, typecast. typecast, nobody wants to use him anymore. And, uh, and, um, and that was it. But we, and his lawyers, we had plans for him to have his own production company and all. And you worked but, on seven movies with him too, right? Oh, no, sure. We did all the movies for NBC. You know, I packaged them and produced them, and he was excited about all of that stuff. And it was important for me to get him away from the character of Arnold, for him to people see that he had the ability to play other roles, and he he did it. You know, and there were things that he wanted to do. He was never, you 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 can't take a kid, eat six, seven, ten years old, and say this is a script you have to do. I mean, we had. We worked under the labor laws, the, the you know the Coogan laws. We, yes. we uh, abided by them uh, tremendously. You know we had to, and I wanted to. Hmm. So, all the kids on different strokes. They went to school in the morning. They did their show in the afternoon. Uh, Lear's company was the Cadillac of all production companies. Norman they, Lear, they yeah. were they were the best, the best, and um, and there are others that are. There, but the way they treated Gary and the kids on that show was, you know, it was uh, it, it's historic. It's uh, it, they were masters at what they did, you know. And um, I've always appreciated uh, them. Uh, for, Would you say that Gary was uh, misunderstood and and the media in certain ways maybe sort of um, to advantage of him in certain ways, just in the way that they reported certain things, or maybe they would just pick out certain things and not make things well-rounded in their depiction of him and especially yeah. in the later years. Well, you know, uh, I have a different background from people that, you know, a lot of people that became agents. Uh, I spent, you know, close to 10 years as a union cop, a rep, a rep in New York for, for after. So I knew the I knew the um, working conditions. I knew what how actors are represented, and how they're misrepresented, and how they're taken advantage of. So I um, 
you know, I watched him, I watched like a hawk. I, I think that the press has a field day with loving to tell the story of child actors that are um, taken advantage of by their parents, you know, and um, this, this wasn't the case. It didn't happen. It simply didn't happen. And, and you know, you know, if I had to go to court and prove it, I could prove it. You know, and they were always asking me, well, where did his money go? Where did all his money go? And, uh, you know, the, the point is that we, you know, there were accountants, there were investments, but we can't expect uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Coleman, whose background are not in the business, they came out and trusted everybody, you know, and 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 that's what happened. And, and you know, so to this day, the when the name Gary Coleman is mentioned, people say, oh, you were his agent. Isn't it awful what happened with his parents? And I said, that's not the case. It didn't happen. <laughs> you know, it simply didn't happen. And um, so that's that's where we are uh, with that. And I think that- um, I imagine you missed him too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, press, the press will do what they do, you know? Yeah. You know, here's the truth. And, and if somebody wants to talk to me about proving the truth about about him i i'm open for that discussion and i think that that's why i'm excited about the uh, the documentary because we yes. have to talk and uh, you know the truth is for free it's just totally for free you just come to me and i'll give it to you <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and, and, exactly. And, you know and, and that's the case in every case you know there are stories and i know this is a fact where, where the parents of child actors do take advantage of them but this isn't one of them yeah. you know and, and everybody's different um in every case and i hope that parents of kids that are in show business will, will, will listen you know uh to this i i i think it's a it's a whole industry out there of taking advantage of kids that want to become actors. You know, there's a, yeah. you know, there's their pictures and their resumes and their auditions and, and all of this. And, you know, me, I let them go to school and let them study and let them follow the pattern and, and let them work. No, nobody pressured Gary to work. None. Uh, at no times. And they would accuse the parents of making him work. And I, I've been with them when, you know, they, they Gary was booked to go to Australia. The, the they were the the Australian television industry was going to fly him down first class and and, and give him a tremendous amount of money. They loved him in Australia, and the parents thought that his kidney numbers uh, were, were just a little high, and they canceled it. And they've canceled shows. I, I can remember Mrs. Coleman walking on the set when Gary was in overtime and saying, "This is too much for him. He's going home." And, and they don't they don't want it they, they don't want to hear those stories you know but they're true right exactly so uh, you know there's, there's that so we'll look forward to the documentary for sure <laughs> somebody else that you, you represented many many people as an agent representative for them Kim Zimmer of course people know from the daytime soaps and so much more what was it like representing Kim well Kim was uh, I think she was about 19 when I met her in Chicago. She was wow. fresh out of theater school, an incredible talent, uh, yeah. you know, gifted. And these are kids that I met in Chicago and mm. all the actors I met were in Chicago. And I, um, and she had an abundance of energy and, uh, you know, she was a singer dancer. And yes. I the whole industry, yeah. you know, there was Wit, too. very but, funny. She had like this oh, comedic timing. Oh, very funny. Really fun, hilarious, mm -hmm. and the, the point is that a lot of these kids, you know, they they were fresh out of school. I met them all in Chicago, and I challenged the producers in New York at all the soaps. I said, "Do you have an hour of your day to just see these people work?" And um, and of course, I knew them from my after days, and they said, "Okay, bring them in," and we did uh, uh, ten actors. I brought them into one life to live. They hired five of them. <laughs> she was one of them. And uh, one of them, uh, Nancy Gron is still working to this day. That's on right. General, General Hospital. And um, the rest, uh, John Mansfield and uh, Andrea Evans. And then I had some on uh, Another World, uh, Wesley Fenning. Oh, yeah. World. And and I had um, uh, Tim Hart, who was his name. He was, I found him at a, a school in um, where I lectured. Yeah. And I had some other kids. Uh, 
uh, Nancy Sloan. I found her at the American College Theater Festival and uh, and brought her out. And um, and to me, I, I don't understand agents that don't understand how what it, wonderful it is to uh, discover people and get them work. Yeah. Instead of waiting for them to come through the door or waiting for them to get 18,000 things on their resume. Right. And, um, and if someone's gifted and they have talent, you know, uh, I think it's the obligation on the part of the agent to do that. And people say, oh, Vic, you're old school. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't understand this old school stuff. You know, you, you know, the truth is the truth. It never ages. And, and if somebody can do the work, you have an, I have an obligation as an agent to get them in front of producers and say, look, experience what I'm experiencing. I don't care what's on their resume. You know, uh, years ago when theater producers were casting a Broadway show, they would use the pictures and resumes just to write notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So that at the end of the day, they say, well, do you remember this girl? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll write her note. Uh, and this is, she did this and this and this. And that was it. Yeah. It wasn't the criteria whether or not she could play it in a three act play, you know, right. or a TV series, you know, that picture doesn't do anything. You know, so much has changed now too, because you've got the advent of uh, social media mm -hmm. and all of these, you know, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, right. the, the TikTok, right. and all of these things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now there there's this whole th mindset of, uh, well, you know, in order to have us even look at you, or mm -hmm. consider you, you have to have a certain amount of these uh, followers and, and all of this, right? Uh, we're, 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 and, and sometimes that even uh, supersedes the real, the talent, the years, right. the resume, the experience. Right. And like you say, the person beyond just these numbers of followers right. and clicks and all of this. How mm -hmm. do you feel about all that? And how's that changed the dynamic I, uh, for, the, for yeah. the performer? Yeah, I, th I think that um, being a union cop and being a union member, I think that after SAG and Actors Equity uh, have a role in in destroying this kind of thing, and they have a role in in um, in, in uh, fighting this kind of. Uh, uh, I think it's tragic. I think they should do something. That you know, the union's position on everything is the actors' working conditions, and. Um, and I think that applying a number to somebody's name is so external and so so wrong, you know. And I think the union should get involved with this instead of just uh, every year saying, let's negotiate a new contract based on cost of living and overtime and things like this. But there are other issues that the union could get involved with. I encourage the students when I teach, uh, when I lecture, to be part of the union because they are the union, you know. Um, and, and I think that's important to do it. And I, so many of the uh, union people don't want to uh, aggravate the casting directors. You have to understand that most of the board members are, are members themselves, are, are, are actors, you know. Right, right. They're, they're vulnerable to being uh, swayed by people that might hire them, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, it's a, it's a little conflict as far as I'm concerned. But you got to fight. You got to fight. We, you know, the unions didn't come about by themselves. It was the actors who fought for the who who, who created the unions to begin yeah. with. You know, the the producers didn't decide one day we want to pay residuals. It didn't come out of nowhere. You know, they they didn't decide that we want to pay overtime, <laughs> right? You know, or credits. Yeah, exactly. or, that, that wasn't them out of the kindness of their heart. Yeah, you know, we had a we had a fight for everything um, that we that we did back in the thirties when they created actors equity and, uh, and then AFTRA was called AFRA American That's right? Yeah, the radio artists. And, and it's a wonderful history. I bring it up all the time to talk to the students about, you got to read the history of this union and how, how some actors fought for the rights you have today. And I think we should get involved and not allow producers to make this thing so external, you know, so, you know, a person should be judged by their number I mean, someone goes to Juilliard for four years and comes out brilliant. And, and don't look at that unless yeah. they have a certain amount of Instagram yeah. followers or likes yeah. on Twitter or whatever, uh, tweets and yeah, or, or, and some will um, feel, I guess, pressured or compelled to have to do that, to, to make right. that 
that uh, TikTok video or, or just to do whatever to get themselves out there because they well, think that's agents, the only way they're going to be seen these days. Their agents tell them that. Their agents tell them when they come out of American Academy, take the uh, take your theater training off your resume because it tends to scare the movie producers and the, the, the casting directors. I, I think that's, it's nonsense. I mean, what's the, what's, look, acting is acting. You know, we divided it into categories years ago for um, monetary reasons. We divided it so that there could be classes on camera technique and, uh, and uh, audition technique and, and all of this. And we've created another art in audition technique. And, uh, and these people are trained to work. They can work every place they want. Why, why would I go in and be afraid of the camera? You know, and um, the camera's got to rep the camera has to follow me. <laughs> Right, exactly. I'm the, I'm the event. The actor right. is the event. And, uh, right. you know, we go to see the Yankees play or the Knicks. Their camera's all over the uh, the field, you know. And they're there to cover the event. They don't bring the baseball players in in the morning for camera rehearsal. Make sure when you hit that home run, before yeah. you run around the bases, stop and give a nice thumbs up and smile to that yeah. network camera. Hit, hit, hit your mark. <laughs> hit, hit your mark. And, hit your and, mark. Right. And, and thousands of dollars these kids pay on, 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 on technique for the camera. I, and I, I say, you know, there's three words that I that, that I teach in, in a camera. It's suffer in place, you know, just yeah. suffer in place. That's what we do in life when we, we feel our deepest emotion. Why don't you teach camera technique from the point of view of, um, of human emotion? Because we don't move when we feel our deepest emotion. And, and uh, let the camera cover us. And they used to do this in live television, incidentally. That's, right. how, they, that's how the producers and directors would watch the show and find the way so they didn't disrupt the wonderful beauty of the, the natural organic a project, you know, and um, so yeah. that's where we are, you know, and I'm fighting for that. And people say, oh, that'll never happen. I said, well, when you say it'll never happen, that's music to the ears of the people that have done this, you know? Yeah. Well, I was, I, oh, I come from the school of thought and was always trained and always told by the veterans in the industry mm -hmm. as, you know, those who sort of right. paved the way and those who set the, uh, you know, the stone rolling mm -hmm. and even in college, university, all of it, that even in what I do, you know, as an on-air personality to learn everything, appreciate it all, know a little bit about what everybody around you in the studio, on location, on set, stage, mm -hmm. wherever you are, know and respect and honor what everybody's doing and know a little bit about it because you never, you may never know when one day somebody fell down and has broke their leg or somebody didn't show up or something mm -hmm. happened where they don't have anybody to fill in and do that. But you have a little bit of knowledge from it and you can run over there, whether it's writing, whether it's producing, whatever it is, right? know something about it. And then also, I remember that we were always trained and I would always admire the, uh, especially the hosts, the television personalities, the radio personalities, like the Regis's and the Dick Clark's mm -hmm. and the, the others, where these folks were the uh, everyman host. You right. can, they can host anything from a cooking mm -hmm. show to a talk show, to a music show, game show, shopping show, public affairs show, live, scripted, taped, ad lib, didn't matter. Just bring them out and tell them this is what we're going to be doing. And then their personalities would then right. carry things and it would all meld together. And you don't always see a lot of that anymore. Now everything is, uh, well, you have to stay in your lane and mm -hmm. you have to just be super at that niche. Don't That's try right. this other thing. Don't try this. Don't try that. And I, I myself, looking at my own background, I have look at the paperwork, the resume and everything and the reels. And I'm like, I've done all these different things like these veteran hosts mm -hmm. and all, and I wouldn't change a thing. I think it enriches what you offer, but we are in this time of niche, you know, you're that, mm -hmm. you're that only. Uh, and then everybody that has a cell phone and a camera also feels that they are <laughs> what you have done for years right. automatically right. Right. <laughs> without the experience and training. Right. 
You know, uh, Jim, I bring a picture of a snowflake uh, photographed by scientists to my lectures. And I give out the picture to every student. And the picture of a snowflake has a design that's absolute. Every snowflake is different. And it's hard to believe this, but there's been a study by scientists that say they've taken pictures of snowflakes and, you know, and they're gorgeous symmetrically to look at, but they can't find any two of them the same. And the reason I give that to them is to show them that everybody is different. We all had part. That's our the makeup of our soul. And I encourage the students. Um, and I would say the same to you as a host that our our uh, talent is our what, what the image we have in our soul. We're all different, and that it's you know I encourage and inspire people in in this ent in entertainment business to uh, represent who they are. You know, and that becomes your talent. It certainly becomes that. I proved that with, I didn't prove it, but Gary Coleman proved it. He had no training. He, 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 he went forward with what, who he was. So you create your own, your own um, reality, your, who, who you are, and you do things the way you are. And, and, and you, you cannot, as it, no matter what you do in this, in this industry, you cannot be subject to be changing your, your, um, your design, you know, your gut, your your soul, and that's what makes all of us unique. That's you know, being expressing that. That's what makes us unique. And and nobody owns the American film, television, and theater audience. We can't tell them what they like, you know. So all the philosophies on putting numbers next to names of people, or how you have to format your resume, format over substance, you know, right. how you have to do all this stuff has nothing to do because the audience, most of the audience don't care. They don't care. They want they want to be entertained. And if they see somebody and they, they don't look at your resume before they watch you in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> the resumes that aren't given out to people, well, these is no names in this film. We're going to watch it, but we want to see the resumes first. They go in, they pay their money, and if, the, if they're entertained by truth, you know, yeah. by somebody's soul, you know, what, nobody to interfere we have actors going to auditions, going to three different coaches before they work. These are trained actors. They're spending a fortune. When they get to the audition, they're, no, they're doing nothing that represents the character. They're doing audition technique because they're told that that's what you have to do. The people sitting behind the desk are looking to see, can you play the character that we write? Right. What are you doing? You know, and, 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 and this is what I'm pushing. This is what I'm talking about because I know it works. You know, those kids that I got on the soaps, I didn't coach them. I wrote the scripts for them when they when they went and auditioned. I directed the scenes, but they were hired on who they were, on their own image, on their own quality, their essence, you know, the it quality. That's how they, because nobody sat on top of them. So you must speak this way. You must, you know, this is the new trend. You know, they played the character. That's what they did, and and that's how they work. And and I believe that it will happen today. I believe that if if they if I can encourage people to do that, we will have artists again. You know, so not not automatons, not machines. You know, <laughs> <laughs> one working. size fits all cooking. Yeah, a yeah, number. Exactly forever. right. Tell us about this phenomenal uh, film in pre-production in Europe about yeah. the Holocaust that I know is near and dear to your heart, right. the Lambert Chronicles, depicting those individuals in high government positions and high ecumenical positions in the hierarchy mm -hmm. of the Church of Rome during and after the Holocaust who aided and were complicit with the fascist Nazi. Right. So much more. Tell us about, about this. About uh, 10 years ago, a friend of mine introduced me to the grandson of Warren Lambert, Major Warren Lambert. Uh, Major Lambert was one of the eight judge advocates at um, the Dachau trials in Germany. He was the youngest uh, military man uh, involved as a judge. And the grandson kept all of his notes, his diaries, which he wrote during the uh, trials. And the collection that his grandmother kept is was estimated to be worth to a collector over $5 million. And in his notes, he talked about 
what happened at the trials and all of his uh, investigations that he did separate from the other judges. So he, he asked lots of questions. He wrote diaries and his wife, Hazel Lambert, had the presence of mind and the intelligence to keep all these notes. Uh, the grandson, Andy Woodowis, uh, contacted me and he says, would you like to look at these things? And it was phenomenal what he came up with. His, his personal notes were hundreds of pages written at the time the trials were going on in, in pencil. And he listed his comments on every SS officer and every guard that was tried. Um, and last year in, in May, uh, I went to Dachau and I stayed over there for two, two months, but I was there prior to that and uh, convinced them to do the courtroom scenes in almost the same building that they took place 75 years ago. And we're going to do it again, as a matter of fact. So we did it in German with uh, subtitles, but it was it was filmed, but it was also in subtitles while people were in the theater watching it. And um, so it was quite an experience. We recreated the courtroom scenes because we had books. There was only four or five books that kept the dossiers of what was said by the lawyers, our lawyers, and the defense people, and by the SS officers and um and we did it, and we did it in a, a little stylized way because we had the, the the poor people that died as as ghosts watching the trial and commenting on it at the same time. <laughs> you know, so it was uh, quite fascinating. And uh, this was not the whole script. The whole script has to do with his observations of the people in our government, at the State Department, that um, were totally complicit. <laughs> With not helping anybody, you know, and uh, in the Church of Rome, we had some problems there. And uh, so it's a very controversial piece, but um, it took me years to get it done. And I guess um, I had to go to Germany to get producers interested in it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell the story. The produ they all want to tell the story over there. And um, so we're in a position now where, where uh, we'll do the project at Dachau again and um and now we will uh, we have some people interested over there it's a fascinating story it's a uh, it's and it seems to be uh, replicates what's going on today you know mm. the, uh, uh, it, 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 it's hard if you want to understand the present you have to understand the past you have to understand yes. it. so uh, me because I'm a triple libra you know born under the sign of libra I have fair oh. practice so I wonder I, why we're yeah. getting along so beautifully and effortlessly oh. as if we've known each other for 20 oh, years. Are you doing Libra. Oh, Libra. good. September yeah. 24th. Oh, well, good. You're at the, you're in the first decade. I'm the third of October. And um, so the point is that uh, I. Do you like balance and harmony? Oh, well, I have to have balance. I have to have balance. <laughs> <laughs> you both in justice. I can't, I you can't. see both sides of a question. Yeah, you see yes. both sides, and then yeah. it takes us forever to make up our mind. Prophetic, yeah. sympathetic, yeah. creative. Yeah, yep. yeah. So, so, and and this was such a story that that um, I don't I don't know. I get you know I when I was born they they didn't know what to name me, so they named me. I was born during the war. I was born during the the, the you know the uh, World War Two. So they said let's name him Victor for victory. Ah. And every project I've worked on has to do somehow with that period of time. I've written four Holocaust scripts and um, don't ask me what attracts me to it. Just people come to me and they, you know, write it. But, you know, there, there's something about that story that um, when, when you, and I met with, I've done uh, lectures at synagogues. I've done lectures with people and uh, he, you know, and I, I've talked to survivors, you know, I met a man in, uh, in, in uh, Ohio, uh, who was 90s in his 90s and he 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 listened to my lecture about the holocaust uh, story and he said uh, i want to tell you um when i was 7 years old my mother went this way and my father went that way and 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 when he just said that i couldn't write a line you know you, you, you know more powerful when you talk to the survivors they can only talk up to a certain point and they stop you know right um yeah so there's there's something about it and and they're all forgiving 
you know, in a way. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. it, it's, it's amazing. You know, we, we sent a ship of the SS St. Louis was sent here with hundreds, hundreds of the, the, the Jews that were, that were trying to escape, you know. And when the, the ship got here, we turned it around. We sent it back. You know, yes. There, there's something to be said. You know, it's not just the one man that created. I won't mention his name, but it's not just him. You know, he 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 had help, <laughs> and I think what is so wonderful about um, being in this industry is that we not only could we lament about the misery of the Holocaust and the poor Jews that suffered, but we have we could do something. We could tell a story. Yes. And and one of the great things about this craft, and I don't want to say the industry, the craft, is that we hold a mirror up to events that are so mm -hmm. at atrocious. Yeah. And we show people. And well, one of the reasons why the governments are all, always so watchful of the movie industry and television and the theater is because we know we can reach the, the soul of 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 the art you know it's like and the you know, truth be told yes right and and the truth be told and we we can hold a mirror up to to, to that and show the audience what's going on i see great similarities to what's going on at the border to the ss st louis being being sent away you know uh there were uh, people that were saying the exact same things about the jews as they're saying about the people at the border and what are these people supposed to do? They're they're escaping tyranny, and uh, they're trying to save their lives. I think we have to. There's got to be compassion someplace, you know, somewhere. And when you tell the story, yeah, then you you tell it in such a way that it could, this thing should never ever happen again. But there are people out there that want it to happen again, <laughs> you know. And uh, you got to tell the story. Lambert himself was not well known. Uh, you know, he was a major in the army, and and um, but if we all could be like him, who spoke mm. out, mm. you know, that maybe this would have never happened. You know, uh, it pulls no punches, like you say. It uh, it has depicted powerful. the back rooms of the Vatican, the hallowed yeah. halls of the U.S. State Department, mm -hmm. and uh, and lots more. So it's well, going to be did, revealing. I their lines, you know, the the, yeah. the, the 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 discovery I made were things that the Pope said at the time. It were things that the uh, that the secretaries of state said at the time. It's their dialogue, right? It's their, language. It's their um, actual wording. It's their actual words, and um, so I, I just feel a moral and ethical obligation to tell that story, and um, and, and that's it. And that's the way we should work as as artists. Is there a uh, one word that had stuck with me since we chatted uh, started the conversation? As like I said, I don't call them interviews; I call them conversations. Mm -hmm. The word craft, you use the word craft a lot. And I really like that depiction of what all of this is, mm -hmm. the, the work and the industry and the art of it all. And a lot of times there is the business side. That's why it's called show business. But there mm -hmm. is the craft of it all, mm -hmm. the artistry of it all, right. that right. sometimes the feeling of it all that sometimes is sort of shoved aside and not as revered and maybe celebrated as it once was. Mm. And you seem to be on a mission to either restore it, dust it off, or mm -hmm. even bring to uh, other generations coming up the fact that it really is still mm -hmm. a craft, an art form. Mm -hmm. Yes, right? that's, that is my mission. You hit it right on the nose. And that's why I go and lecture, because I think what's happened is that we were taken over in the 60s and 70s by businessmen. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need, the, the craftsman doesn't need business, we do. However, we're, we, we, were, we were here first, you know, and we need to be celebrated and the craft needs to be celebrated. Right now, if an actor in, in uh, Los Angeles was to call himself an actor craftsman, he'd be laughed at. That's, that's, a, sad, that's a sad reality. You know, but but that's the case, and uh, and so we have to instill in the performers that are training, and they get enough of this, you know, um, where they're learning that they can't forget the fact that it's a craft, the the ability to go in on a stage or in front of a camera, and to convince an audience that what they're watching 
is happening at the infinitesimal time they're performing. They are who they say they are. It is, you know, is amazing. It's just amazing that 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 this happens. It's a transition, and to watch people take on the life and the soul of another person, and and to to for the hour and a half people are in the movie theater or in the theater that their lives are just they can't even feel themselves sitting in the chair. They are so engrossed in what's going on. And when the when the show or the movie's over or the play is over, they don't want to move. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I uh, one of the many jobs I had when I was going to acting school was at the uh, New York Public Library. And I remember picking up a bookmark that was in one of the books. And it said, uh, it's not so much of what this um, book says, it's what it whispers to you. <laughs> so in other words, after like you finish looking at a, uh, reading a book, you sit for a while and say, what was this all about? And then when you, when you, when a movie is over and you so engrossed in motion, then it's over. You sit there for a while. Have you ever noticed in the theater people don't move when the sh the credits are going? They they're yes. certainly spent, and 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 the point is that if you can get a message across, yeah, see, that's what the artistry of this is about. You know, right? You know, I, I grew up with Arthur Miller. I studied Miller and Clifford Odets, and my God, when they when they wrote, mm -hmm. you know, they wrote about the times and they brought us. They brought us into the lives of the character, and you, and you, you, you thought those people were real, you know. They were doing um, "Waiting for Lefty" in Chicago at the Goodman Theater once, and the audience got so riled up they jumped on the stage. You know, they got on fire with with everything. You know, theater is very powerful. Yes. And when I say theater, I don't just mean the stage. It's theater. That, that's why I keep convincing these people that there's. You know, you bring your same emotions in front of a camera as you do mm -hmm. as the senior march, as you do on a soap opera. You you have to let them find a way. Yeah. To, to celebrate those emotions, you you can't. You know, how much is too much for the truth? Oh, that's too much for the camera. But how much is too much for the truth? You see the truth. The truth. Yes. I mean, you don't need camera technique. You do, but it sh it shouldn't outweigh that wonderful thing that happens from your gut. Oh, yeah. so your your vocal cords, and that's it. I um, showed not that long ago one of my friends, one of my favorite movies, just because it's one of those movies that draws you in. It has a message. I love the music underneath the underscoring. I love all the actors and actresses involved. I like the way the set looks, just the whole idea of it. Guess who's coming to dinner? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. and Sydney Portier and Spencer sure. Tracy. Yeah. And I showed it to a friend. Um, couple of years ago and she was watching it and she said it's too slow and i said wait a minute what oh do you mean it's goodness. too slow well it's not moving there's not enough flash and, right, right, right. and i'm like that's not what this is about the, the a matter of fact the fact that it is devoid of all of those fast camera movements and noise and and craziness mm -hmm. The fact that it's drawing you, pulling you into the characters, to the hearing the music and the the camera angles and mm -hmm. the expressions on the faces, that's it right there. Not mm -hmm. the fact that it has to be sped up and moving fast and chopped and in and out quick. And uh, I couldn't believe it. We had a pretty you know, deep discussion yeah. on that. I couldn't, she thought that it was too slow and, I'm, and I've watched it multiple times and I love mm -hmm. it. And she just said it wasn't mm -hmm. because she's used to watching things that are uh, flash and dash and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, yeah, you know, just uh, there. I, I call them externalists. You know, I've never heard of that being described as too yeah. slow. Well, <laughs> well it is, doesn't it just aggravate you when you know something is a work of art and people yes. don't get it. And you, you, yes. you just, I feel sorry for aggravate was a good word. <laughs> it just yeah. gets, gets you to the point. So if you don't see this as gold, it's gold. And you then know? you're not feeling right. Yeah. So well, like, it, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. Uh, right. But I, I think we, we have an obligation as artists, whether we're actors, singers, dancers, talk show hosts, you know, whatever, you know, we have to we have to take a deep breath and say you know there's a time to study and there's a time to perform and when you're there's no in between 
and and when when I'm working, I'm working, and I let the theater ghost take me through my spirit. You know, that comes to me when I'm working, and I can't be bothered with the technique if it's there and if I'm trained. You know, it's like it's like being. You know, I always use the the connection because I was a, I'm a veteran. Uh, you know, in the army, this what's so wonderful about uh, the basic training is that you don't get a chance to think; you get a chance to be disciplined. And then you you see that you made it through these ten weeks of intense training, and 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 then the the best thing that ever happened to 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 any of us is to is the spirit and the the camaraderie in 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 the army, the the solidarity. Uh, I, I try to impose that on on the performers. You know, you will never have friendships and working together as great as you had when you were in the military. It's really amazing, you know. And, and so there has to be this thing of where, you know, I'm here to celebrate myself. Like you do your show, you, you come in, nobody should tell you what to do. You, you, you have a, you know, you can be advised, obviously. It doesn't mean, you know, but what makes us all unique is our ability to have strength and conviction on what we do. And, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and that carries us through. And the audience loves that, you know. Yes, they do. They, yeah. they can sense that you, you have no power, be no no inhibitions being you, <laughs> none. Exactly. Or whoever you're playing, and it's, yeah. it's your thing. So uh, that that's the way it works. Theatrical justice, the seminar lecture yeah. you give based on your observations and experiences and mm -hmm. twenty plus years working as a talent agent and actors rep with AFTRA and of course so much more spirited talk to encourage the theater trained actor to always maintain the ad integrity of the craft of acting as well as their own integrity and you try to inspire the young actors trained at the theater schools and theater programs mm -hmm. not to allow the casting system of America to categorize them as green or beginners because they have no experience the fact that the training is the experience tell us about that well I I think that uh but going along with what I said, you know, I, I have a thought about, I, I just don't complain about the industry. I've kind of come up with a, a, a theory. I would love to start a uh, National Actors Center uh, for, for trained and gifted people where they could work. And if there, there was this group of people that took over our craft years ago and businessmen, then we don't have to change what they've done. We create our own. So I've create I've tried to create a national actors television network that will only employ actors from the theater background, and also a um, once a year a showcase of actors graduating from all the schools in the country and challenge the casting people to see them work. And uh, so that's how I answer this. You know, it's one thing to sit back and complain and say, "Well, you know, it's it's, it's hard on the actors and all." I'm giving them a, a a way to work, and and it's saying you know you can't as you mentioned you can't give up on the integrity of the craft you can't give up on yourself, and um and that's the encouragement because what's happening is that you know one of the things that they've imposed on us is that the casting directors now hold the definition of what acting is, and and it it the agents will insist that you take lessons from casting directors I, and, look, and I, I don't want to attack their intelligence nor do I want to attack them it's a hard job that they have to do but you know I think there comes a time when you just have to understand that I've been trained as a performer now it's time for me to work <laughs> you know and and this theatrical justice is what that that word really says is that I'm trying to give them a chance uh, to you know, to work and giving them an opportunity to work, and 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 um, and we we have to set up conditions for them to work. We can't we can't have them trained at the greatest schools in the country, and then be told you have to change everything you're doing to meet this system. See, there's that's, that's something wrong with that reality. You know? I love the title, the actor and the craft of acting held. Yeah hostage tell us yeah. about that well that's exactly what what i've come to that conclusion i wrote that book uh, a few years ago and i keep adding to it all the time it is it's that the craft is held hostage we, we're we're 
you know, we need to get out. We need to get actors who are trained and gifted, and we need to get them working. Uh, I'll tell you one place that that I encourage actors to work is at the regional theaters, mm. the repertory theaters. Uh, people don't they, they look the other way when you mention that, but you know, there's people who are subscribers at the good the good the uh, Guthrie, uh, the Milwaukee Rep, the Indiana Rep. And those audiences are very sophisticated because the theater came into those towns and, um, you know, and it, and it just, uh, it, it makes them, it makes them think and listen and be appreciative of Shakespeare and Odette's and Miller and, and all of that, <clears throat> you know? So, uh, I'm sorry. What was the other question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you were, to you were telling us about the book itself. Oh, the book. Yeah. The, the book. The book covers um, everything <laughs> I talked about here. Yeah, and and but it gets it goes into more of the chapters. It goes into you know my uh, philosophies I have and um, about auditioning, and it goes into lots of stuff about the history of the theater. Uh, but basically, it's a it's really for the actor, you know, and, and not just the actor, the performer, and yeah. and, 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 and just it's loaded with inspiration, you know. We can't do anything without inspiration. You know, we really can't. I, I don't I don't know how anybody can work without inspiration. You know, you have a story to tell. You're inspired to tell it, and you do it, you know. Exactly. So right. I, I hope the book is inspired. And when I say held hostage, I'm see, it, 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 it means exactly that is because there are people, there are actors, you know, I've been doing this forever, but I've come across performers that are just – have done magnificent work and nobody knows who they are. You know, they can't get arrested. And uh, I've come across actors in, in, in Canada. I've come across them in, in uh, the repertory, the regional theaters, um, you know, and they're perfectly content. I said, my God, this, you're brilliant. You're brilliant to what you're doing, you know? So uh, I, I'm hoping that this opens the door uh, for people uh, I, I don't want to just sit back and just say uh, uh, this is a terrible thing what's going on. But at the same time, I'm trying to create a environment and a place for these, uh, you know, for these people to work. Mm. Marcus, you know? My grandson was told by a casting agent, he was told yeah. he would never make it because he had a bad eye, which he has grown out of. And then she uses certain other letters yeah. with exclamation points. <laughs> Ronald is here. Ronald Rand, of course, our dear mutual friend, the exquisite okay. Ronald Rand. Hi, Hello. Here. Great being along with you all for Vic's inspiring journey. Vic yeah. always reminds us of an exciting way to rethink. I agree. Great listening to, uh, to Vic. Bravo, bravo. And Ronald, of course, thank you so very much for your unwavered uh, love of what we're doing here at the gym master show and support we have a mutual uh admiring between me and ronald uh he's my hero and he tells me i'm his so we we have a mutual yeah because he, he when you speak about men of the theater this is really a man of the theater and um i i met him because i came across the the uh, the newspaper the soul of the american actor and that title alone uh, you know, attracted me because I just said this uh, is such a magnificent title. And then when you read the newspaper and the wonderful articles about everybody in that newspaper, everybody that writes for it, um, you know, has something wonderful to say. And uh, and it, it just inspires you, you know, it inspires actors to, to say, my, you know, there's still people around that, uh, that, that love this work, you know, and, 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 and know why we're here. So, um, yes, shouts out to Mr. Ronald Rant. <laughs> <laughs> the you know, I mentioned, you mentioned early on for you coming up the ranks, acting was something yourself that you had an interest in. Is right. that something that you still would like to no. dive yeah. into? I, don't, I, I think I'm too objective and too conscientious right now to... To, to act, I, if somebody offered me a role in a mafia play, I think I would do it. And, you know, but I, I think I could make a good mob boss. But uh, but not a I, sitcom, Dad. <laughs> no, 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 not a sitcom. No, I, I studied acting, you know, since I was eleven years old, and went yeah. to the academy to do it. But then, but then I started to direct, 
Mm -hmm. know, I, I went back to high school. I did a summer class in American Academy and went and at 16 or 17, I directed the diary of Anne Frank um, and it went in my high school and did it again. When I was in the army and stationed in the Philippines, I started a theater group and this was during Vietnam and um, directed that play and other plays. So I got more into the, you know, to the directing and being behind the camera. I think I'm too conscientious to act. And I, I, I think I offer more to the inspiring the performer or directing that performance. And, uh, you know, if, if it's, it's really fascinating. You know, if someone were to tell me that I'd be writing scripts, you know, um, I never took a class in it. I just, you know, had a story to tell and I could sit back and write. I've written so many projects. I've written uh, all okay, kinds. I'm, I'm on a project now called Truth and Evil. It's the story of, um, you know, we, we, we say the word truth, but in my, I say, what if truth were a spirit and an energy and that could manifest itself into a person and evil the same? So I've made these the principal characters and, and truth has been held hostage. There you have it in a cave for many years and he's coming forward now. <laughs> now, when I sit down, I just, it just goes, you know, the pause go and I just write. And, and uh, it's fascinating about writing because um, you, you have to get yourself out of this thing of what I have to make sure it's formatted correctly and I'm following this. I just get it on the page when it happens and it transitions into, into the person. It's the same thing that happens in any creative process. The creative process is quite uh, illuminating. It's, it's, um, it's a process that happens for singers, dancers, uh, pianists, you know, that once you're doing the work, you have to allow it to happen. You know, I had in the, in my, uh, I was stationed at an air force base, but I was in the army. Uh, they gave me a top secret clearance and then made me a cook. So therefore I can't, I can't share any, any um, recipes with you. But <laughs> my, my <theater laughs> lots group, of rice, lots of rice. In my, yeah, lots of rice. I, in my theater group, I had pilots that were, it was during Nam and they were, they were going over doing missions. And, and I asked one once, I said, how do you do that when you're in the cockpit and you're doing what they said, look, we're trained and it just happens. Motor reaction. When this happens, that happens. We there's no fear. We just do it. Do you know? it. And 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 that's that's the message I'm trying to get to everybody that wants to work in the creative process is that you have to trust your training. You see, you have to trust your training. And people that are gifted, like Gary Coleman, I always said that if Gary had gone to one year at the American Academy or someplace, that he would have never given up the, the craft. Because people that are in it, it, they're organically creative. The days they don't feel like work, they don't have a, they don't have a technique that gets them back into it again. See, mm -hmm. and they don't know how they do. So, so they have to be taught some discipline. So that that's that's why training is important, and and um, because it comes to you, so that you're given the freedom. The day the camera guy says seven five three two one, you're on. You know, action. That from that point on, you just trust the training to bring you back. You know, I mean, if you're doing your show. You don't have to think about, am I going to screw up? <laughs> You've been doing how many uh, th uh, hundreds of episodes? And and you just, you go you go with it. You can't question yourself when you're working. Can't, you know. You just got to do it, right? Exactly. You got to do it. You got to yeah. do it. And, and, that, and that there has to be some enjoyment in this work. You know, we yes. just rehearse and rehearse. And then we have to be the day we perform, we allow that spirit of the character to take us over. And it does if yes. we allow. It. Right. Exactly. You know, and we have to trust. It's it's called total trust. And then then we feel relieved because we we work correctly, you know. But mm -hmm. we can't be victims of, of a system which says you must do this, you must do that, and you must do especially when actors go to auditions, they have to be free of all of that. You know, to they express, have to right. They, yeah, they have to be free and let let the theater ghosts take over. You know, if if you believe in that, I do. Of the many, many, and it's probably a long list, actors and actresses mm -hmm. and folks in the industry that you've always been inspired by, that are some mm -hmm. of your favorites that you've always uh, just mm -hmm. enjoyed watching their craft. Mm -hmm. Who would be mm -hmm. some of the 
the legends yeah. and others that you've always enjoyed? Well, I, you know, it's cliche, but the point is, you know, De Niro and Pacino always get to me, not, not because they're Italian, but, the, but because they they seem to exemplify this, what I've, everything I've been talking about during our interview here. Uh, they seem to trust and they go with it. And when people interview them and say, how do you do what you do? And they, it's difficult to, to get it out. You know, some of the great actors, when they're asked about that, you know, they talk about, I, I think the same things I do, which is to trust your instinct and to trust and go with it and to not question. So those are the people that, you know, Meryl Streep certainly does. And then, you know, you know, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm in it too. Of course, yeah. of course. And when when you go to see, you know, I've seen plays all over the place. I've seen them in Milwaukee at the Rep, and there there are actors that that people don't know of that do that, that can inspire you, that are gifted, and it, it just to me, it's it's. I, I enjoyed going to the colleges around the country when I was an agent. I did many more lectures than I do now, but. I think I was out six, seven times a year and I would go and watch them work and then, you know, bring them into LA and just, you know, I financed their trips mm -hmm. and all. And, and, um, and people with agents would say, well, why do you do that? Why do you do that? I said, you know, let, let me tell you, there's, there's a certain, it's like discovering gold, you know, it comes out of the earth. It's gold, you know, and, and all we have to do is brush it off. You know, we, we, I, I, I never understood agents that didn't have a, an enjoyment of yeah. taking people from, and I don't mean nowhere, you know, but taking people from where they least expect it, you'll find them. And, and they're gifted. You know, we have, look at the show American Idol, you know, or America's Got Talent. Yeah, they do, you know. Uh, so I want to do the same thing, but not as a television show or a contest. I want to provide a place called the, United Stages of America. That'll be a television show. And what we will do is take our cameras to every regional theater in the country and every week present one of their original shows. Take it to every university and college theater program and do one of their projects. And, you know, and show America that say, listen, you know, there's talent, there's gifted people that could work. And, um, and, and I, I, you know, whether somebody would buy that show or not, I don't know, but I think it's worth doing. We we can't fight the system. We have to create our own because they created a system that we work under now. You know, the thing about doing your own auditions at home and you have to look a certain way and your your resume and picture must be formatted according to this and this and this. And and so that's fine. If they, this is America, you can do whatever you want. But I think there's a place, you know, for um, actors to, you know, that are, that are not, that are turned down because their resume is not correct <laughs> or they don't have a number next to their name. And so, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's nonsense, you know, and, and, um, and I think we have to provide that place and now all of a sudden it becomes another system. See, and, and we, we all live happily. You want to go there? That's fine. This is, I'm taking this road. You take the road less traveled. I'll take another one less traveled. You see what I, and that's how we do it. Why do you love so much what you do? You're so passionate about it. And you've well, just been to so many different yeah. areas within oh, it. Yeah, you've got you, this enthusiasm and thirst continued. Well, you could easily, uh, you know, like I say, I use this analogy, you could have your feet in the sand in South Beach, sipping a colada, no, no, uh, no. swinging back and forth in a hammock saying, I've done my part. I've done good. I'm, I'm not but done yet. You're, not. <laughs> you're, 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 you have this thirst for still doing tell us where that comes from well i think it comes it's not just me i i've met many people like me i was trained by people like that, that that are like this i think that in any you don't have to be in show business or the entertainment field i think that you have to have projects you know it keeps you alive and it gives you a reason to live you know i mean i know people that have lived in their own city one city for the all their lives they have no concept of what's out there you know i mean Look at me, you know, go, going to Germany and going to living in Canada for six, seven years and and watching the rest of the world. I mean, there's so much out there to see. I mean, there's a, you know, you can share with people and you can see it gives you a different perspective on life, you know. And and for us as people in, in telling stories, that's what we do. 
you know, right. we exam we could see this in, in other people. We have um, we're excited by their life. You know, how, how can any how can you not have missions in your life? It gives you the reason to get up and and, and work. Exactly. You know? And exactly. I, I think I you know, you know I'm you know of a, of a certain age now, 110 almost. But uh, <laughs> you know, a seasoned I, veteran. I, I you got to keep you got to keep doing. It. You got to keep working. Well, look, I mean, just look at the things that have happened in your career. Some of them, we just scratched the surface of the many, many things that you've had an opportunity to be involved in, help facilitate for others and for the greater good. Yeah. And you've been you know, a revered entertainment professional on many different levels for, for decades. And, and look, you're, you're constantly reaching pinnacles. I mean, even today. You're on the Jim Masters show live. Yes, I, yes, I am. It's taken and, and you I, decades to get to our show, and yeah. here you are. You're well, feeling I'm tingling. <laughs> I, I, I am honored because I don't get a chance to uh, <laughs> talk, you know, and uh, and to to vent and to uh, to talk about the, the the craft. You know, I write and all, but I you know I love I love to talk, you know, and 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 to talk to people. I think that. Um, there's certain amount of there's a great amount of pleasure when you give you know yes and uh and and sometimes you pay a price for giving too you know but, uh, but yes yeah. you know when you give a lot people misunderstand but you know i i've spent my life giving i i remember oh i was in france once with a friend of mine that was in the industry and he had to go out of town he says i'm gonna let you stay with a family i know and uh, somewhere in the in the hills and in, in outside of Paris somewhere, and this man was I was younger then I was you know thirties and all, and he he took me in the town he was in his eighties and he says he said you know I spent my whole life giving to people, and he says I can sit here in the center of town and drink my coffee and everybody I know comes over and says hello to me, and he says I have no regrets for anything because I if I were to do it again I would do the same thing. He says, I just gave to everybody. And um, I guess that stayed with me. Is you know, how you would answer that and question? And I would answer, yeah, that's the way I would do it and just say there there is there's a joy because yeah, you, you get you get it back, you know, yeah. you really get it back. It's you know, I you know, like any other agent, I could write a book about the people I've represented and did a lot for, and then they turn around and they leave you, <laughs> you know. It's it's and you you shake your head and you say what well, well what more can I do but but you know in my conscience my conscience I have that's the, one of my characters in, in Truth and Evil is conscience but my conscience as a wonderful as a is welcomed in the, in my soul you know yes. I, my conscience keeps me yeah. saying you didn't do anything wrong you, you sleep know? well at night you yeah. sleep well at night and 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 that's what I have to get through to the young actors say look you audition. And you do you you did your work, and if you don't get the job, you go on to the next. Go to the next. And it, it's it's their loss. <laughs> Life isn't over, right? You no, know, it's it's not over. So we have people that critique us. We have people that lie about us, you know. But at the same time, you you know, you can sit with yourself and say, that's not true, you know. But I'll go on. And success is its greatest revenge, you know. <laughs> So the people that do you in, they think they try to end your your career, but at the same time you you go on to be successful and they can't figure it out. They so say we, we, we didn't, you know, we we didn't damage it. Or them. instead of just being themselves, mm -hmm. they try to copy what you're doing right. and, and try right. to become you. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain way that you have to being you and doing things your own way, and to to copy. You know, I'll often say, often duplicated, um, often imitated, never duplicated. Never duplicated. Exactly. <laughs> often imitated, never duplicated. And sometimes people don't think that way. They they think just copying off what you're doing and how you're doing it because maybe you're doing well or successful. Mm -hmm. But there's a heck of a lot of hours, blood, sweat, and tears, years put in, experience, toil, right. Right. all of it that goes into what you're doing to make it look so smooth and easy. Uh right. You know, go off and do your own thing. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Do your own thing. Create your own niche, you know, yeah. and uh, that's it. And you become yeah. unique. You know, you we're know, all unique. You know who did that? Mr. George Burns did that very well. Oh, my goodness. <laughs>
<laughs> he always pops into the show. There yeah, he is. Yeah. He's got his cigar and his red pocket square, and he yeah. usually hangs down below with his martini. Yes, one of my one of my aunts in Connecticut, actually in West Hartford. One of my mother's sisters. Uh, she big, 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 serious collector of expensive dolls. A room filled yeah. with them, preserved and all. Got this got passed down to me, and uh, he's made some appearances on the show and uh, he agrees with everything you're saying. He understood yeah. what it took yeah. and the niche and the whole thing. And uh, he yeah. loved this conversation. He sends love to you from him and Gracie. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I love him. I love him. It's a smile on everybody's face when he pops on him. the show. <laughs> yeah, I did, watched you meet, did you ever meet George over the years? No, 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 no. Yeah. I was, I was young when I watched him. You know? Yeah. I'm not that old, you know, <laughs> I'm not Asian, you know. <laughs> no, but I, well, when I as we know, that, lighting is everything. Lighting is everything. <laughs> Always befriend the makeup artist, the lighting director. Everything, everything. You key, you know, befriend everybody, but there's That's a few right. that you really don't want to tick Met off. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and the editor, and you know, the camera right, people. Right, right. <laughs> So uh, this was really fantastic. This really was an amazing conversation. Uh, we chatted about an hour and a half, but it didn't feel like it. It went no. by in a New York minute and uh, it was thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable. I want to just show you a couple of comments coming in from our Lovities. They already said you're a Lovity, which is kind of cool. This uh -huh. uh, has been a great conversation. Jim and Victor, thanks for being here. Uh, Merlin in Canada, Kathleen in New York City. Victor, thank you for being here. Great conversation uh ronald of course says vix enthusiasm always brings a huge smile to my face yeah. Yeah. thanks for all these great comments everybody um victor truly this was wonderful i hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed yes, the time did. with me as much as i have with you thank you and i'm very honored to be on the show and i respect what you're doing sir I appreciate that. And as my father uh, has always said and told us when we were kids, you know, the sage advice from our father, the Irishman from uh, New York City, uh, he always used to tell us as kids, you know, it's kind of stuff that was like something you'd say to a, a buddy or a colleague, but he always, he always gave us a lot of sage advice as kids and still is able to do that now. Um, Whenever anybody says, he would say, Jim, you know, whenever anybody, and I'm like nine years old, uh -huh. whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be very happy to do it. <laughs> the management. So I'll say to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> I will. I will. I will put it in writing. I'll get people to watch your show too. Oh, well, I appreciate that. That yeah. would be, yeah, we're growing it and it takes a village, as you know. I know, and, I know. Uh, and it's Good something thing. like, I, like I said, I started doing, you know, that I do on the side with my mm -hmm. bill paying day work in television and radio, but it's just grown and we're doing something unique, special mm -hmm. and, and uh, a little old school, but with a modern twist here. And it seems to be working. Maureen in Arizona says, very enlightening conversation. I love how you encourage people to uh, reach beyond their limits. Thank you, Vic. She watches in uh, Arizona, thoroughly yes. enjoys the show. Matter of fact, I met her along, she's one of our lovely viewers, and I met her along with Kathleen in New York City when Maureen came to the city to uh, celebrate her sister's birthday. Oh, wow. I said, let's go to Sardi's. And oh, believe yeah. it or not, we chatted so long, the group of us, we closed the place. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then Maureen loved it so much at the holiday time. What does she do? Get this big package uh, package that's waiting for me at the post office. And inside is a mini me, Mr. Lovity. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Put your you. master's mini me right here. <laughs> that's wonderful. Now you know things are cooking, right? Um Sherry Larson in Kansas says, thank you, Victor, for a wonderful evening. Love your passion for what you do. Please, please, please do come back. Jane in Sweden. Thanks, Victor, wow. for being here. And thanks, Jim. The pleasure is all ours. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, I, I like to do interactive, like there are studio audience uh, virtually. Mm -hmm. uh, truly, I hope you enjoyed yourself. This was a pleasure. I hope we uh, break bread in person. We thank I'll you. let you know when I'm in New York. I'd love to meet you. That would be fantastic. And and Ronald as well. We we thank Ronald. He's a big yes, fan. Tremendous talent, big supporter of our show. And uh, 
Everybody wants to do wants to know what you're going to do next. Are you going to make yourself a sandwich, Victor, or something? No, I, I yeah, I probably will. You know, so. you hungry? You, I mean, I, you started you, this last week. This you see, <laughs> you I don't know what day it is. Yeah. I don't have breakfast or dinner. I don't. Have know. you ever met two New Yorkers that can't talk? Can't talk. And, and everywhere you go on this planet, you always meet somebody from the New York area. Every right. you can go. I was, I was at a two by four yeah. diner in Albuquerque after That's a TV right. shoot and in the diner. And I heard That's these right. accents and I said, wait a minute, are you from the New York area? And they said, yes, actually Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, fellow Libra, that's right. Continue to uh, do what I do, and let's try to balance and harmonize the world. Gotta be I yeah. said, I said that people. I said to people, you know, it's not always easy being green, as Kermit said, and not always easy being balanced and, and That's trying right. to balance and well, harmony. It's hard life being a Libra. Really I said uh, it is. I said yeah. I, we should have been born on Venus, the planet that's of love. Right. And they're that's like, right. no, well, no, 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 no. Yeah. Without you, Libras. This place would implode. So that's we need right. the Libras Someone's here. Someone's got to keep us organized. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> you're the okay. best. Thanks all right, for sharing all this time Thank with you us. so much. Bye Thanks bye. for all you're doing as well. You know, speaking to the students and paying it forward. I think right. that's very commendable, Victor, on many levels. Thank you, Thank you very Spread much. Spread the word about our show. You're welcome back Thank anytime. We'll keep the porch light on for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Take bye. care now. Thanks. Bye. Incomparable Victor Perillo here on the Gym Masters show. And we chatted about a lot of different things about the glorious entertainment industry. He is an industry vet. He's been in it for decades on many different levels as an exemplary writer and producer, gifted lecturer, and also former AFTRA, which I mentioned earlier is the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists Union Rep and also talent agent for some of your favorite stars, Gary Coleman. Kim Zimmer, and so many other daytime stars as well. And he shared so many extraordinary stories behind the scenes about some of the talent, but also about the industry and uh, what it takes and uh, just what it's all about. He, again, is a gifted person and uh, he knows everybody. And this was really a pleasure to have him on the show, give you a little perspective behind the scenes of what it's all about, how it takes, what it takes and how it works, um, which is kind of cool, right? There's always something to learn every single day when you have your eyes and your ears open and you listen and you sort of gather. You guys are great. Some great comments throughout in the Lovety Hall chat room, which is terrific. And um, yeah, this is great. Again, he's uh, he's worked with so many people and he's got some amazing projects too that he's working on. Uh, the Lambert Chronicles, we're going to look for that coming up as well. And of course, he he talked about uh, Gary Coleman uh, on many different levels and, um, you know, what he was like as a person behind the scenes. He was his agent who for years. He was he knew him since six years old from different strokes and, and so much more what Gary was like as a person. And of course, we lost Gary in uh, 2010, which is hard to believe. It seems like it was just yesterday, doesn't it? Uh, of course, actress Kim Zimmer, soap star, and so many others. Really fantastic uh, chatting with uh, an industry legend on so many different levels. Uh, coming to us from Burbank, good old downtown Burbank, California, as Johnny Carson used to say. But Vic, of course, from his home, beautiful home in uh, Burbank, California. Writer, producer, lecturer, Gary Coleman's former talent agent. Yes, but so much more. And uh, what a cool conversation right here for all of you on the Gym Masters show series. I want to let you guys know they've got so many amazing guests that are coming up uh, every day this week as well. Tomorrow we have one of America's finest landscape painters. He is revered. He's got extraordinary gallery work. We're going to see a lot of it tomorrow. Tim Stevenson is joining us here exclusively just for you live on the Gym Masters show live. That'll be 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Truly one of America's finest landscape painters. His work is extraordinary. He's with us tomorrow. And then the day after that, coming up on Wednesday, Terry J is going to be with us. She is what they call a cowgirl shaman. She's actually in, starring in the Peacock Network's Paul T. Goldman, their brand new series, which is incredible. She's an intuitive. She's a medium. 
pet psychic, animal communicator, extraordinaire, highly renowned, highly revered. She's in Paul T. Goldman. Dee Wallace, the beloved actress, is also in this series that's on Peacock Network, which is owned, of course, by NBC. Terry J., the intuitive, psychic, medium, animal communicator, cowgirl shaman. To learn about that is with us on Wednesday. It's going to be an extraordinary show. And then get ready to laugh on Thursday, gang, because we have the extraordinary Susanna Spies here, comic, comedy coach, writer, and humor enthusiast. She's going to, she also teaches a lot of others. That's why she's the coach, teaches a lot of up and coming comedians and comedians how to write for comedy and how to be comedic and presentation and so much more. Susanna Spies is going to be with us on Thursday. She is very well known in the industry. She's hilarious. She's going to make us feel good. She's going to make us laugh, you know, laughter and levity and love. You got levity. Going to have a lot of it on Thursday right here on the Jim Masters show. Just some, some of the many guests. Again, our guests come from all different backgrounds, celebrity friends, culinary experts and Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, all of it. And if you're watching um, the Fox television network and you're watching the current season of Hell's Kitchen with Chef Gordon Ramsay, you may remember we had Summer Sellers, the breakout chef on that TV series, that series which is airing right now, this season, the current season of Fox television's Hell's Kitchen uh, with Gordon Ramsay. She's on it. And she's made it down to five. That's right. She's been narrowed down to five. Check out the full epic conversation and exclusive interview that we had with her right here on the Jim Masters show. You can see it on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. Hundreds of episodes of this series you can see on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. So check that out and, and so many other episodes that we have done here for all of you. If you go back, so much, uh, so many good times, a lot of levity here with all of you. And thanks for all the great comments and enthusiasm. And um, Kathleen says, thank you, Jim. Great show. Mini Jim looks right at home. Love it. I agree. He does. He's comfortable. He's hanging out with George Burns, taking notes, uh, learning about George's career. Thank you, Jim, for an amazing guest. Wonderful show as always. Thanks, Sherry. We always work hard to put in a a good show for all of you, all of you. And uh, you guys are just terrific. Thanks for all these great comments. Don't forget to relax. Absolutely. Uh, around here, we don't say goodbye. We say see you later. Ciao, cheers. Auf Wiedersehen. Uh, Buenos noches. We say salancha, sayonara. Moi loop. Take care. Be well. Cheerio and cheers. And uh, don't forget to relax. Yeah. Take time for one another and take time for yourself. Enjoy and relax. R-E-L-A-X. Don't forget to relax. See you on the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Spread the word about our show. A lot of work to put it all together for all of you, but I hope you're enjoying it. And let us know. Like. Give us a like on our episodes. Nice thumbs up. Like. You know, the big thumbs up you see on all of the episodes on our YouTube channel. Click the thumbs up like. Leave a comment. Drop a comment for us in the comment section on YouTube. There's a comment section right into all the episodes. Thanks to all of you who do take the time to do that. That really helps our show grow and expand when you leave comments for us on the YouTube channel and all the episodes and uh, give us a thumbs up. And also, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, click the subscribe button. Make sure you also click the notification bell icon, the little bell icon next to the subscribe word so you never miss any of the uh, episodes. That's right. We'll keep you abreast of all the episodes of the Gym Master Show series. You guys are fantastic. Hasta la vista, baby. That's right. As Maureen says, and that's what it is. And mini, mini me says the same thing. You guys be well. Take care. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the Gym Masters Show. We'll see you on the next one. All right. Hope you enjoyed. We love having you here. Take care and be well. Cheers. <laughs>